Do I just click the next slide and I'm, I'll be there? Yeah. Oh, I'll be there. Thank you. Wow. Um, this is, I'm feeling a, a bit emotional because this is the place that, uh, for me, the scholarship all started, which was at Cass Tech and in Detroit. And so it's coming home uh, to this museum and to downtown Detroit to get to present this work. And also to get to sit here with Toussaint, who, um, as he mentioned, we uh, had a conversation about Attica. I, I'm thinking it was 10 years ago, because I'm thinking I'd been working on this for maybe three years at that point. And I think both he and I felt a little frustrated, because we felt that we were sitting in the midst of uh, nothing short of a, a genocide, a, a, an apocalypse, which was mass incarceration, and yet felt very much that um, nobody was talking about it sufficiently, nobody was understanding it, the crisis sufficiently, and as both of us are historians and kind of brainstorming about how do we make this history uh, that we write about matter today, which, by the way, as historians, that's a bit of a sacrilegious uh, premise to start with because I think we go to graduate school told often that that's exactly what you're not supposed to do, that history is somehow pure, um, you're not supposed to have an agenda, but I think for both of us uh, the agenda was really clear that we needed to understand how we got in this mess and, and, and ostensibly then how we might uh, get out of it. So it's really heartwarming to both be here in Detroit and to thank you so much to Charles Farrell for, for putting this on and everyone who's been so lovely. I, um, I decided what I wanted to do, because the thing about Attica is that we all know a little bit about it, but I decided to do the book because I was kind of shocked at how little we actually all knew about it. So what I wanted to do uh, before we sit down and talk is just to go through some slides and tell you a little bit about Attica. What, what is this thing that this book actually covers? Um, and I, I hopefully won't take too much of your time, but this might also generate some, some more discussion. So this is Attica, this is 1971. This is a huge, sprawling facility that was built during the Depression. And I can tell you that when I went into this facility in the process of doing this, uh, this book, it looks exactly the same today as it did in 1932, mm -hmm. uh, inside and out, uh, literally down to the locking mechanisms on the cell doors uh, and in the galleys. And indeed, even today, the catwalk that is inside to this day still has the chips from where the bullets hit the cement. Um, so this is a facility that is enormous. It's in a tiny, tiny town in upstate New York, an all-white town. And yet, everybody inside of there uh, is coming from cities like New York City, um, Buffalo, Rochester. And that is because in 1965, under the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, we began a war on crime. And that part and parcel of that war on crime, which incidentally we didn't need to begin because the crime rate was historically completely unremarkable. We did it as a backlash to the freedom struggle of the period. That moment brought intense, intense policing into cities across America, including Detroit, which is what leads us, of course, into the Detroit Rebellion. But it also leads this facility to be jam-packed, 2,400 men uh, packed into Attica. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, packed into Attica, who had been for months and months and months and weeks and days and actually years uh, talking to each other about the need for reform and talking to the administration about the need for reform. Why reform? Because these are guys who are living not only jam-packed into tiny, tiny cages, but they have one square of toilet paper a day. They have two quarts of water in their cell to wash with, wash their cells with, uh, to drink. Um, they are hungry. They're being fed on 63 cents a day. And, uh, and they're forced into effectively slave labor uh, in the prison metal shop, out in the yard, in the laundry, in the kitchen. And uh, without belaboring this, because we'll talk more about what actually leads to the rebellion on September 9th, uh, essentially everything blows apart. And uh, this is actually a real photograph, uh, which is just this incredible photograph of the actual calendar from one of the galleries um, with the date September 9th on it. So this event begins um, 
in large part, uh, despite all the organizing in the yard and the political discussions in the yard, the, the event actually being is because of another brutal act on the part of prison management, which is to lock these guys in a cell with two guards who don't know what's going on. Panic ensues, and uh, in minutes, the prison is complete chaos. But it becomes a rebellion. The chaos, which is uh, people running around, arming themselves, and um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time with this. What am I, am I pointing here or am I pointing here? I'm pointing back here, and that will help me to know where I'm pointing. There we go. Um, this is the level of chaos that we're talking about in the first few minutes. People are grabbing anything to protect themselves. They are terrified. But within a very short period of time, nearly 1,300 men moved to one of the four cell blocks, I mean, sorry, outside yards called D yard, and something historically remarkable happens. They each elect representatives from, uh, each cell block ele elects representatives to speak for them. And those representatives stand together at a negotiating table and they finally realize that, th or they realize this is finally the opportunity to bring the world inside of prisons. Remember, prisons, of course, are the most closed institutions. We pay for them. They're state institutions. We have no clue what happens behind those walls. And the Attica brothers, as they called themselves, were determined to bring the, ins the outside world in. So the media is there. They ask for observers to come in to help them negotiate. They stand together, and even though there's representatives, uh, they uh, all allow everyone to speak. It's an incredibly democratic uh, moment. Again, as Toussaint says, cr uh, across racial lines, across lines of political division, and indeed across language, uh, bar barriers of language. There was a lot of Spanish-speaking prisoners in Attica, and everything that was said up at the mic was translated in Spanish to make sure that the Spanish-speaking prisoners would understand, and vice versa, if one of them were speaking. These guys come to the yard. It's an incredible part of the book um, when they organize and do this. There's one anecdote in the book that I'll just quickly share, which is that um, one of these old, old men in the yard, there's this is recounted where he's walking around that first night of the rebellion, and um, tears are streaming down his face, and his friend says to him, you know, what's what, what, you know, what's going on, brother? Are you, are you okay? And he says, I haven't seen the stars in 22 years. And that just really captures kind of the, hu the human essence that is this story. Very quickly, it is a tense city, an extraordinary experience, uh, extraordinary moment in democracy. There is a medical tent, which is what you see on the upper left um, and, and the bottom right. There is a food tent. There are uh, stations where people can get um, more blankets or whatever aid they need in this moment. This yard is also ground zero for some of the most interesting discussions of prison change you've ever uh, witnessed because they invite all of these outside luminaries to come in and oversee negotiations with the state. Uh, this is a picture of on the right Tom Wicker from the New York Times who they invited to the yard because he had written uh, columns very sympathetic to prison reform at this time. In the middle is the esteemed William Kunstler, who was a, uh, a very important uh, Marxist lawyer determined to defend uh, many groups of people and will offer his services to the Attica brothers. And on the left is Clarence Jones, the editor of the Amsterdam News, a really important black newspaper out of New York City that would publish letters from prisoners. And so the guys on the inside wanted these guys and guys like them to come to oversee negotiations with the state. And these negotiations were extraordinary. On the top left photograph, you see the Commissioner of Corrections, Russell Oswald, uh, and he's sitting at the table with the Attica brothers. And I want to call your attention to the top right because I'm going to talk about these guys again. In the uh, cap and the sunglasses is Frank Big Blacksmith. He is uh, uh, asked to be in charge of security in the yard to make sure that the hostages are protected and to make sure the brothers are protected. Incidentally, the brothers are, or the hostages are surrounded with two groups of prisoners um, and to, to make sure that no harm comes to them. They're given mattresses, they're given food, and indeed the most injured of the hostages from those initial moments are taken outside of the prison so that they can get medical care. And this is also very important because, of course, later the hostages will say the prisoners showed them far more humanity than their own employers. 
Uh, in the bottom right, you see, oh, I'm sorry, and then next to Frank Bigelow Smith, the tall guy with the glasses is L.D. Barkley. In Attica, 21 years old on a parole violation for driving without a driver's license. Um, he was due to get out in about three months. He was expecting a, a son, who, by the way, became a lawyer here in Detroit. Um, and, um, and he is not going to fare well in this, uh, this story. Uh, and there's speech making, and demands are uh, articulated that, um, you know, when you see the book and you read them, you'll be struck by how fundamental and basic uh, the rights were uh, that they were asking for, um, and how basic, basic conditions that we all take for granted had to be listed uh, in, in a, a string of uh, demands to be heard. Um, Meanwhile, as these negotiations are going on, every barrack of troopers in the entire state of New York, and I do mean every, are sending troopers to Attica. The state, the National Guard is also coming to Attica. This is one instance, actually, though, where the National Guard plays a quite laudatory role and does not partake in the brutality. Um, but the state troopers uh, are standing outside of Attica for four days. By the way, also corrections officers from all the upstate prisons are descending on Attica. And over four days, they are arming themselves to the teeth. They are passing out weapons. They are not writing down any serial numbers. They are deliberately, one guy tries to write down serial numbers and he's told to rip them up. Um, they are angry because rumors are being circulated that there's all these atrocities going on on the inside. Uh, my book shows you where a lot of those rumors are coming from, which is from yours truly, the FBI. Um, the FBI, by the way, is reporting on the small uptown prison, sending missives, not just to the federal level, but um, I have these documents where they are informing the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the CIA, the Attorney General, the President, the Vice President, what's happening here. So this goes to Tucson's point about how high the stakes are right now about whether we're going to have real democracy in this country. Um, these guys, are the, the troopers, are amassing. And meanwhile, Governor Nelson Rockefeller is determined to take this prison with, with force. The observers, who by now number about 30 people, including lots of people that he's put on this board, uh, Republicans, uh, who are telling him, 201, do not retake this prison with, with force, because if you do, it will be a massacre. And they use those words. But he's determined, and he's determined because he wants to, uh, he, first of all, he's a cold warrior. He believes that this is a conspiracy of the left. He doesn't believe that there's anything legitimate going on in this prison in terms of demands for rights. And he is determined to show the Republican Party that he is tough on crime. This is the same guy that two years later we know is going to pass the Rock Rockefeller drug laws, which get duplicated everywhere, including in Michigan, with the 650 lifer law, automatic life sentences for 650 grams of cocaine. It destroys Detroit, um, but we can get to that in a minute. They beg him to come to Attica to talk to the prisoners, not one-on-one, -on -one, but just to stand outside and tell them that if they surrender, he won't, he will ensure that they are not harmed. That was one of their most important demands at the end of the day, because they were terrified of what the reprisals might be. And he says no. And indeed, he encourages what you see here. This is a supply truck of weapons being passed out. So if you ever underestimate what this is looking like from the outside, uh, this is just a snapshot of it. And as night falls on September the 12th, I know what the Attica brothers didn't know, which is that they were intending on coming in the next morning no matter what. And indeed, they made sure to not tell the Attica brothers that there was going to be an ultimatum. I mean, they weren't going to give the Attica brothers an ultimatum. They were going to say, if you don't give up, we're going to come in and kill you. That was very deliberate. And indeed, the next morning, as the Attica brothers are waking up, it's chilly, it's cold, it's rainy, they think that negotiations are still in play. And indeed, when they hear a helicopter revving up, some of them are so naive that they think that Rockefeller is coming to Attica and is gonna to talk to them. But he's not coming to Attica. That helicopter is loaded to the gills with uh, canisters of tear gas. 
And incidentally, this is not a gas like a, you might imagine gas, right? It's, it's billowing in the air. This is a powder. And that powder is dumped into D yard, which by the way is about 50 yards by 50 yards by 50 yards. So think about uh, a football stadium, half of it. That's how small this is, you know, half of the 50 yard line. This gas, this powder coats D yard. And it's in people's nasal passages, in their eyes. They are choking, they are vomiting, they are falling to the ground. And that's when he sends the troopers in armed with their weaponry. Right before he goes, they, he sends the troopers in, this scene you see is very important. Because up on this catwalk, and it's very difficult to see, but the brothers have made a decision. They are so terrified now that they realize it's going on. They've made this decision that they're going to bring some hostages up onto the catwalks, and they're going to surround them with, uh, with prisoners with homemade weapons. And they kept saying, show the helicopters, right? Because they want to say to the state, don't come in, because if you do, you're going to kill your own, right? And everyone's hoping that this is going to be enough, including the hostages who are terrified, as the prisoners are. And in this moment, the book talks about this, just freeze frame for a moment. There's one episode in this story where one of the hostages and one of the guards, who were friends because when he was a kind of a younger guard, he had supported these demands, he's going to get shot four times for his troubles by another corrections officer. But they're standing up there, terrified, um, trying to tell each other, you know, if I gotta, if I don't get out of here, tell my wife I love her. Um, you know, just making these moments of peace, right? Um, but it didn't work. In fact, the troopers don't pause for breath. Uh, even with their own up here, they come out over the catwalks, and you can see how opaque the air is from this tear gas that has already mowed everybody over. Notice that the guards have these masks on, which in some respects benefits them because they're not gagging and retching, but on the other hand, they can't see very well. And so it is an absolute free-for-all. And a helicopter is circling overhead saying, surrender and you won't be harmed. Surrender and you won't be harmed. And all you can hear on the when I mean, you hear footage of this, as they're saying, surrender and you won't be harmed, is da -da 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 -da. And what is left is utter carnage. 39 uh, prisoners and hostages shot to death. Uh, 128 shot so severely that they, some of them have six, seven, eight bullet wounds. And they are crawling for safety. They're trying to get under things for safety. Um, they're trying to help each other. Some of the most poignant photographs uh, are uh, when the guys are trying to help their fellow men who were shot so severely. One of them was carrying a prisoner, Jomo, because Jomo's been shot like six times. He ends up shot two more times. His friend is trying to carry him, and the, and the trooper says, put him down. And he says, and he, before he has, any, he has a chance to put him down, the trooper shoots him in both of his arms just for trying to help his fellow prisoner. These are the men who are left. They are stripped naked. Uh, oh, here's some more of the carnage up on the catwalk. Um, actually, before I talk to you about what happens next, so it's a, it's a bloodbath. These are the state officials who then stand out in front of the prison and tell the entire world, and it is the world, because at this point there's media there from everywhere, that something altogether different happened. He says to them, to the reporters, the prisoners have killed the hostages. They have slit their throats. And in that moment, that story goes out on the front page of the New York Times, the front page of the LA Times, over the AP, and across every newspaper in every small town in America. And worse, perhaps worse for what ends up happening, they say that one of the prisoners has castrated a guard that guard, by the way, was Mike Smith, the guy I told you about who was a friend with the uh, prisoners, and that they castrated him and shoved his testicles in his mouth. That lie, they not only said they saw, but they said they had footage of it, and that is going to touch off a level of torture and brutality that is quite unimaginable. Um, but the reason why Mike Smith was bleeding so profusely from his abdomen was because he had been shot by a fellow corrections officer. 
And by the way, uh, they knew that probably within an hour uh, of this being over. So this is going to have tremendous implications for the future of criminal justice in this country, which we can talk about. Um, these are just some of the headlines as a result of that lie, the front page of the New York Times. Look at the bottom one, reflect a barbarism wholly alien to civilized society. Calling for the death penalty. It was all a lie. This is the LA Times. The governor called them cold-blooded killings by revolutionary militants. Never happened. Thankfully, there are a few heroes in this story. One of them is a coroner in upstate New York, himself a supporter of Goldwater and people like that. But he has the bodies coming in, and the troopers are trying to intimidate him. But he sees what he sees, which is that these guys have all been shot by bullets. And he goes and he tells the story. The, the uh, Rockefeller administration uh, tries to discredit him. They bring in other coroners to tell a different story, but even those coroners are scientists at the end of the day and stick by the truth, which is that the prisoners have been killed by bullets and so have the hostages. And it is such a mess that there has to be investigations, and there are a number of them that I talk about in this book. There are congressional hearings, there's citizen commi commission hearings, the Justice Department looks into this, which by the way, uh, completely abandons. Uh, the Attica Brothers does nothing. And the most important investigation was that created by the state of New York, by Rockefeller himself. And this bottom investigation is going to be organized in the Organized Crime Task Force Unit in New York, because this is how convinced Rockefeller is that this is a conspiracy of the left that has nothing to do with legitimate grievances. So he wants to prosecute this thing under mafia law, basically. And this investigation is funded, and unbelievably so, and their task is to go after crimes committed at Attica, whether they were committed by prisoners or guards or police. And um, this book will tell you some behind the scenes stuff I found incredible. Basically, it's doomed from the start. Uh, this has never been reported before because uh, from the start, Rockefeller puts the state police in charge of investigating the retaking. The same guys who've gone in there shooting everybody get to investigate it. He has meetings at his pool house in his mansion between the head of the state police, the head of the Attica investigation, and his people, where they get their story straight over a series of long weekends at the pool house. I'm sure the cocktails were flowing. And the upshot of this is that this investigation ultimately indicts 62 prisoners and not a single member of law enforcement for what goes down at Attica. And so remember when I told you that the story about the prison slashings, the, the throat slashing story, that does a whammy on the future of pr prisoner rights. But so does this, because for years, every American is watching as prisoner after prisoner is being indicted and standing trial for what went wrong at Attica and not a single member of law enforcement. I invite you to read the book about that behind the scenes. I finally found the documents that tell you who the real, uh, the real criminals were. Um, and that's why this book is very controversial right now. It's why the state of New York uh, is now announcing it's gonna put the Attica documents online. Um, I can tell you that there's nothing interesting online so far. Um, the trials of the prisoners, as I just mentioned, go on and on. There's incredible support on the outside for the Attica prisoners. This is one of the most dramatic defense efforts in American history, one of the most important coming out of Detroit. Many of you know Ernie Goodman uh, and his son Bill Goodman. They, they go to New York to defend uh, one of the Detroit-based Attica brothers, uh, Bernard Strobel, who went by the name Shango. Uh, it's, an, it's an incredible story in this book. Uh, very much Detroit mobilizes uh, to help the Attica brothers. This is a defense effort akin to thinking back in time, the Scottsboro Boys. I mean, this, this, this mobilizes a generation of young people. Um, and ultimately, in the middle of all this, there's this guy who's also a hero. He looks a little buttoned up. Uh, he too was a conservative Republican, but he's a prosecutor for the inside of the Attica investigation. And he's got a conscience. And he can't understand why 
39 people are dead at Attica and not one law enforcement official or trooper has stood trial. And he pushes and he tries to do the right thing and for his troubles he basically gets shut down because in the meantime Rockefeller is trying to be the president of, or the vice president of the United States. And all of a sudden the whole thing gets shut down and he gets shut down and he becomes a whistleblower. It's actually his document that nobody has seen that I found in this book that I was able to tell kind of the behind the scenes of what was really going on. He blows the whistle as a result of his heroic efforts because they hounded him thereafter. Uh, they finally get rid of the indictments against the Attica brothers, but here's the deal. And say, basically all is forgiven. No prosecutor is ever gonna go after a trooper either. That's the deal. And that's under the, the governorship if you carry. I'm gonna just speed up because I'm taking too long here, but let me just say, the story wasn't gonna go away because the shooting was just the beginning of Attica. Meanwhile, while this is going on, the Attica brothers are being tortured for days and weeks and months. This guy on the table, remember I told you the guy with the sunglasses, Frank Big Blacksmith, this is him. He's the one they accuse of castrating the guard. They torture him for hours and hours and hours. They put a football under his neck and they tell him that if he drops it, that they're gonna shoot him. And he believes it because, of course, he's just seen outright murder in the yard. And I call your attention to the other guys next to him because this was a multiracial rebellion. And no matter who you were, <laughs> you got the brunt of the racial uh, barbarism and hostility and the epithets. And uh, no one was spa spared from this level of abuse, but some certainly, like Big Black, got, him, got it worse. And they're all lined up. This looks like a scene out of uh, a much earlier time in American history. And they are beaten. They are forced to run through gauntlets. They are put in cells naked where uh, they are tortured, literally. They are not given any medical care, even though some of them, again, have six and seven bullet wounds. Doctors are showing up from all over the country. They won't let them in. There's a team of black doctors that come from Lincoln Hospital in New York City. They sure aren't gonna let them in. And meanwhile, people are suffering and dying inside as a result. So when I say torture, I don't even wanna read this. You can read it. But when I say torture, I truly am not underestimating. Uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not exaggerating when I say torture. And all of the brothers are trying to tell their story. They're trying to say this is going on. And I will tell you that nobody is listening from the lowest level bureaucrat, through the state senators, through the governor's office, through the presidency of the United States. Richard Nixon has one question. He says, is this a black business? And Rockefeller says, why yes, Mr. President, it is. And that's all he needs to know. And not only that, he basically congratulates him and later on says to John Ehrlichman, who's sitting next to him, now he owes us one. And Ehrlichman says, you know, Mr. President, not a bad day. This four to one kill ratio, this will basically shut, shut him down from now on. This is all at the White House. And the Justice Department, National Guardsmen are coming to the Justice Department and telling this story was told to the Justice Department. James O'Day, a National Guardsman, was so traumatized by what he witnessed that he tells this to the Justice Department. And guess what they decide? There's no grounds here for a civil rights case. The Supreme Court, they try to take this to the Supreme Court and the only one interested in this story is Thurgood Marshall. And the rest of the, the, rest of the bench says, no thank you. But one guy, this is Frank Big Blacksmith, the guy on the table, the guy who's there in the yard in those first pictures, he doesn't give up, and neither do the rest of the Attica brothers, and thus begins a 30 years fight for justice to be heard. And ultimately, they are heard. They do have a financial settlement with the state, but by the way, it's a moderate bit of justice because they never say that they're sorry. They never admit responsibility. And this is his attorney, Liz Fink, attorney extraordinaire, who basically devoted her entire life and her life savings to this case. And I'm jumping way ahead. These are the hostage families. Um, they too have a 40-year fight for justice in this story. Not only are they killed by their own employer, but they are swindled. 
their employers, the state of New York, shows up at the houses of grieving widows and says, here's a check, Mrs. Cunningham, for $42 to tide you over. This is